Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth. That is Drew Galloway, and we are getting ready for a very important matchup for the Wildcats coming up. Now, I will say, I, I thought about this, uh, I don't know if it was earlier today or yesterday, but there was conversations going on about other college basketball games, and it was thrown out there like, at this time of year, every single game is a big game when you're trying to battle for NCAA tournament seating and you know where you're going to be ultimately when the conference standings finish out. That is true for everybody, but it is especially true for K-State given the way that they have played really for the last month now. I, they, they haven't won back-to-back games since they beat Baylor and Oklahoma State to get them to 4-1 and one in league play. Their only win in the last six games was that big Monday game against Kansas uh, over a week ago now because they didn't play this week. So this is a major one against TCU. And K-State's already dropped one home conference game this year. They only lost one last year. Can't do it here. What's your expectation for what we see from K-State and how they come out in this game? Because, look, there's a lot of different things we can talk about, K-State versus TCU, but this is another game where you K-State has to have this. You cannot – you cannot miss your opportunity here. And we said that before the Oklahoma game and they got beat by 20 at home. So what do you expect from K-State? Um, in a weird way, I, I'm expecting like them to come out and you might see both versions of K-State because that's kind of what we've had all year. You don't know what you're going to expect. I don't really know what to totally expect, to be completely honest. Uh, this K State team has just been so Jekyll and Hyde. Of one minute they look amazing, and the next minute they look like a high school basketball team or worse. So you go into this game, and we talked about this before. Of like you just don't know what you're gonna get, and I, I think that TCU is kind of in the same boat to be completely honest, because TCU has had times this year where they almost won an Allen Fieldhouse. And then they also had a moment this season where they got trounced by Iowa State in the first half when they played them in Fort Worth and then had to claw back and somehow made it that game a game because Iowa State kind of took their foot off the gas a little bit. So it's two teams that you really have no clue going into the game what to expect. And the Ken Palm projected score of 71-70 TCU is kind of how this game feels. Yeah, TCU has had... uh... I, I, I want to call them rough stretches because the most they've lost in a row this year is two games. Uh, they're worse. You know, K-State's in a, a stretch where they're one and five in their last six. TCU's worst six-game stretch. Uh, they're they're three and three. Um, so there's, you know, a lot of ways to, to look at this. And TCU, while inconsistent at times, and they have games that you want back, like you said, that game at home against Iowa State where they dug a giant hole early. Uh, Cincinnati, the game they lost on the road, they let Cincinnati get back into that game. So there are plenty of things that they wish that they could do over. Um, at the end of the day, though, they've just been they've just been better than K-State. Their inconsistencies, they're able to mask with better performances because they also have multiple top 10 wins during the course of Big 12 play, including one against Houston. Uh, they went on the road and in triple overtime in a game that it felt like they needed because they had lost two of their last three and their only win was by five in a shaky performance at Oklahoma State, they go on the road and win in triple overtime at Baylor. So this team has been able to pull them through, pull themselves up and through things a lot better than K-State has. And really the reason for that is because you look at their roster, they've got four guys that have played in every game this season that average at least 10 points a game. K-State only has three such guys like that, Carter, Perry, and Kaluma. And when you look at those guys, they all do things on a consistent basis that help this team. And I think that's the thing that K-State has lacked. We know this. And that's probably what makes TCU somewhat dangerous going into this is that they have four guys that could carry the load for them. And when you have four, you know, K-State, we're like, hey, can you can you at least get two of those guys to go off for you? When you have four, you have – you maximize your chance a little bit better than what K-State does in getting those guys to give you a bigger performance. So that's all just like basic math stuff. It's like, yeah, you got more guys, more chance that they could do something good against you, a good for them, bad for you. But it really is that simple for K-State. They lack depth, and then they lack a lot of other things that we've talked about that's kind of the intangible stuff 
that helps you get over the top in close basketball games or in games when you might have a, a little bit of a, an energy drain. Yeah, TC is just a, a really interesting and strange team when you look about look at them uh, with their resume and what they what they've done this year because they have that win at Baylor. They have a home win against Houston. They beat Texas Tech at home. But then you look and then you they turned around and laid a dud uh, two Saturdays ago in Texas at home, lost by 11. And it really wasn't that close, to be, to be honest. So they're a weird team in that sense. But th- this also just isn't a matchup that is typically conducive to K-State winning because this is a team that likes to turn you over a lot. And you know who else does? Uh, Iowa State and Houston, who are yeah. some of K-State's worst performances so far this season against Iowa State and Houston. And TCU also likes to get out and run, and they can shoot the three. They aren't great from three, but they have Trey Tennyson, who is an elite-level shooter, although he has dipped a little bit in recent games. But he has shown that he had that special performance where if you're going to win in Allen Fieldhouse, you need somebody to do that. And Trey Tennyson did that, and TCU should have won that game at KU to begin Big 12 play. So you you look at TCU and they're a team that you are worried about because K State struggled in two of the three games that they played against TCU last year too. Well, and you know me, Trey Tennyson, he is a he's your guy. player that 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 would concern me uh, going into this game because he can get hot and he can he can do it pretty well as you see. I mean, forty six percent from three on the season, and that's not because he's just you know. Hiding attempts, uh, he's he's taken the most threes out of anybody on TCU's roster. He's, he's at one fourteen. He's, he's taken a, a quarter of TCU's three pointers this season. Yeah, which they're a team that you know you look at it. It's not it's not a massive number uh, relative to what some other teams have. I mean, they only have one other guy that's taken more than seventy this year, and that's Jameer Nelson Jr. And he's been terrible uh, in terms of his percentage. He's twenty five percent on the season. Uh, so there, there's not like they're going to take a, a ton there. But you, you mentioned the turnovers. The TCU is only second behind Iowa State and Houston in Big 12 play, enforcing turnovers. K State, we know they just hand the ball to the other team. Uh, they are not just the worst in the Big 12, but one of the worst in the entire country uh, in terms of that number. I mean, at this stage, should we just give up thinking K State's going to be able to take care of the basketball and? try and figure out other ways that they can keep themselves in games and give themselves opportunities to win. Yeah. It kind of goes back to what fan has said, where the turnovers aren't a huge killer because they've shown that they can mask how often that they've turned the ball over if they rebound better and get to the foul line better. But one of those things really isn't always in your control with getting to the foul line. And this team is a really wildly inconsistent rebounding team as well. So you look at those two things, but you expect the turnovers. I think if you, if K State has fifteen or below, I think that you're at the point where you're thinking that they took care of the ball pretty well, because it, it has been pretty brutal this season. And last year turnovers were a problem, but I never felt like they were this big of a problem. But I also think that that comes down to just having more talent on the roster last season to make up for that. I mean, it, it, there, it is a significant difference. The, the team last year, they were not good at it uh, in terms of taking care of the basketball, but they were they were 259th in the country. Uh, this year, their team's 351st. And, and last year in Big 12 play, uh, this team, they were 8th. So... It's not like they were as bad as they've been this year, where they are the worst in the league. And quite possibly, like I'd have to go and look to see what power conference teams are worse than them. There, there's no way that there's one that's worse. Uh, let's see here. Um, yeah, you would be correct. Yeah, uh, it would. <laughs> it would be uh, Houston Christian, UTEP, Utah Tech, Middle Tennessee, Stephen F. Austin, UT Arlington, Alabama A and M. Coppin State, Sacramento State, Siena, and Mississippi Valley State that uh, oh, are worse than the, them. The winless Delta Devils and K State in the same yeah. group of like 12 teams. That's never where you want to be. Yeah, not very good. The nearest 
power conference team to K-State in terms of turnovers. Let's see how 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 far do we have to go to find one. Uh, we have to go to DePaul, which uh, the demon the blue the blue demons they're not very good. I don't know if you're aware of this. They fired their head coach yeah. already. Um, they are 25 spots better than K State in terms of turnovers. <laughs> and then let's see how far do you have to go before you find the next one? Because again, uh, not DePaul the most accurate. Doesn't really count. Because DePaul, yeah, because DePaul sucks. Uh, this is where you get into some real team. Seton Hall is okay. is 293rd, uh, and they turn it over 19.2% of the time. Seton Hall, honestly, a comparable team to K-State right now. Seton Hall 16-9, and had, had a tough stretch there. But Seton Hall's had a better stretch than K-State's had at any point this season because Seton Hall ripped off a road win at Providence, a home win against Marquette, road win against Georgetown, who cares? <laughs> But road win at Butler and then a home win against St. John's. And then the, they, they had, went on a three-game losing streak after that, but triple overtime against Creighton, a four-point loss to Providence, and then a road loss at Marquette. And they've won three of their last four now, uh, but they did get blown out by Villanova. So honestly, fairly comparable in terms of what they have done uh, in conference play and the way things stack up numbers-wise. So K-State's uh, it's a lost cause on offense, and – I mean, at this stage, we, we there was a lot that was made of like the five out offense that K State was running, and 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 now you lo you've lost personnel as the season has gone on. What do you think is the biz the biggest contributing factor to K State turning the ball over, and how likely is it to produce an inordinate amount even for K State come Saturday against TCU? It it honestly seems like some of the the turnover issues, and I, I was about to bring this up, is that it some of it is just focus. Because it felt like last year when K-State was turning the ball over a, a lot, it seemed like Keontae Johnson and Marquise Noel were both kind of pressing to make the home run play. Where this K-State team, sometimes the hitting hitting a single can be hard because they, I, I mean, we talked about it after the BYU game where they had two or three plays where uh, I think it was Cam Carter just dropped the ball three times out of bounds. So it, it's a little bit of a focus thing. I, I just also just don't think that there's enough talent offensively for this to be an even average offensive team. And we've seen that over the last eight conference games, especially in first halves. And that, that stat that fan had about points per possession in the first half on Sunday was uh, pretty jarring. That yeah. K-State hasn't been above 0.9 in the last eight conference games in the first half. Um, but I just don't think that there's enough talent there in that it just scares me because TCU is a team that turns you over a lot and is quick to get out and run. TCU is like second or third in the nation in fast break points, so you can't wear it. It's You turn the ball over, you better get back on defense or it's two points. Yeah, it, it's going to be fascinating to see what happens and, and uh, how things look for K-State on on saturday because they have struggled with it you're right about them wearing it uh and this is also a team that already has their struggles defensively at times so having to get back and maybe have guys out of position it's just a, an even tougher situation for them than what it is for even other teams so in terms of what happens on saturday uh who has to come through if k-state wins and then what is the prediction for how this one turns out a K State win probably means that Cam Carter played really well because I, I'm not really blown away by TCU defensively. Like that, it, it's a very interesting game in the fact that TCU is a top five offense in the Big 12 and K State's uh, defense is top five in the Big 12, but K State's bottom five in offense and TCU's mm -hmm. bottom five in defense. So it, it's it'll be interesting from that standpoint of its strength versus strength for the most part here. So you're worried about what TC will bring to the level or uh, defensively. But I think that Cam Carter can exploit some of the lack of size and poor defense. And if K-State wins, I think Carter probably has to go for around 20 because you just don't know what you're going to get from Arthur Kaluma or Tyler Perry at this stage still, which is frustrating in its own right. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm torn on who, who to pick that needs to come through for K-State because I can see 
uh, a, a large amount of guys that could, you know, need to, to be pointed out. But I really just think it's, I think it probably comes down to Tyler Perry. I think the difference for the offense prior to the BYU game, you know, especially against Oklahoma State and Kansas, he had, he had made shots at a good level. Uh, the last three games before that, he had made shots in the offense. I know that the Oklahoma game got off to a pretty brutal start, but he was fine in that game. And then those two games against Oklahoma State and Kansas, he was good for them. I just think that in, in this game, making those shots are going to be so crucial when you get the good look. And you may have to match TCU, a team that, like, if Tennyson gets hot, which is what you talked about and why they almost beat KU, is he got on a stretch in that game. You're going to need some answers. And Arthur Kaluma had been that guy for most of the season, but he's dipped off lately in his shooting. And I'm with you. You just don't know what you're going to expect there. Plus, TCU's a little bit bigger. So uh, they're, they're going to be able to throw a lot of guys that match up with Kaluma size-wise uh, all right. Uh, so I think this comes down to Tyler Perry, who the looks have gotten better, I think. He just needs to have the confidence to, to take them. And then when they are there, they just need to start going in. Like, at this point, there, there's nothing you can say other than the fact that he's missing shots he should make, and that's a real problem for K-State. So I think it's Tyler Perry um, because I think whoever goes off with Carter and Kaluma, you need him to be the sidekick or the, the, the second piece because – his shooting is something that can be a difference maker. Uh, and I just, you're not going to get that from both Kaluma and Carter together. I, I don't anticipate it. So that's where I would go. Uh, in terms of my prediction for the, the final score here, I, I mean, I could see this going a number of different ways, but at the end of the day, K State's lost five of their last six. And the only game that looked good from start to finish basically was the game against KU and we know KU has had massive road struggles recently um, there's also a chance like Kevin McCuller wasn't at 100 percent in this game and I'm not trying to take that win away from K-State K because it was it was a great win it was a fun environment and you know all that good stuff but Kansas is a flawed team so you kind of beat a wounded duck uh, on your home floor who has struggled on the road so I think TCU probably wins this game because I, I'm just not confident K-State comes out and brings it and gives a good performance. So I'm going to take the Horn Frogs in this one. I'm going to go 73-61. to 61. Wow, you're, you're saying that you think the game might get kind of out of hand. I, if TCU wins this game, they're going to win it by double digits because it's going to be K-State's made too many boneheaded plays and given them easy points, and they're just not going to – they're not going to have any energy. So – uh, if TCU wins, it's it, honestly it's probably more than that. If TCU wins, uh, I think that this game is genuinely a coin flip. Like I, I've gone back and forth on who I think will come out on top, but I, I keep just going back to K State is so inconsistent. It's just hard to pick them. So I I, I lean towards TCU winning like seventy four sixty nine. I think that, that it'll be closer. But I, I just think that TCU makes too many good plays at the end. Emmanuel Miller is like a legitimate like first team All Big Twelve kind of player right now. Yeah, he's had a good season. Sixteen points a game, six boards a game, and he's shooting at forty percent from three. Uh, no, he, is, he, he's also like twenty six, so he has the added <laughs> advantage that he's just so much older than everybody else. Yeah, I mean that it do, that does help to uh, be to have played college basketball since two thousand nineteen. So that is a bit of a benefit for you there. Uh, is he really 26? No, he's like 23, 24, okay, 22. Say, yeah. he, but it just feels like he's been at TCU specifically forever. So, same with Micah Peavy. Like, I, yeah, I, Peavy feels like he's been there for a while. But maybe it's this era of college basketball that when a guy stays for more than two years somewhere, it's like, man, that guy's been there for a long time. Uh, because both of those guys started in different places. Miller had two years at Texas A&M, and PV had a year at Texas Tech uh, before he went to TCU. But that also could contribute to it, as the fact that PV has been in the Big 12 for four seasons now. Uh, I'll, I'll add in something that this is just asking for trouble for uh, Saturday, but let Micah PV shoot. Holy cow. Yes, yeah. He is he is such a bad shooter. But he did. He did light K State up in the Sprint Center uh, last year in the Big Twelve tournament or T-Mobile Center. Sorry. Yeah, that that is true. Uh, well, wait. Are you think you're thinking of somebody else other than Micah Peavy? Because uh, it wasn't Peavy that had the 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 good game there. Uh, I don't remember who it was, but you're right. It, wow. 
one of their really bad shooters. Oh, I know who it was. It's 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 my the guy that I hate the most uh, on their team because he's got a crappy uncle, Chuck O'Bannon. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Chuck yeah. O'Bannon went for 22 in that game, and he was 4 or 7 from 3. Uh, Mike Miles, fake good player, also <laughs> had 22 and ma- made four threes in that game. So As, as I say, one of the really bad shooters, I just remember just going off in Kansas City, and I was like, oh, are you serious? Yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was Chuck O'Bannon that had himself a night there. Yeah, so ban Chuck O'Bannon's uncle. Yeah, uh, TCU was forty four percent from three in that game, which uh, on the season last year they uh, were thirty percent. So they had they had themselves a good showing there uh, uh, in, in that game. But good news is that Horn Frog team not playing tomorrow night. Uh, also in that game. Uh, TCU only had seven fast break points. Uh, they did end up scoring 20 points off of turnovers, though, in case they turned it over 20 times. So, And that was a good K-State team with good offensive players and guys that went to an Elite Eight. This is a team this year that they may not even get to be an eight seed in the NIT. So uh, we'll see how things work out on Saturday. Not a lot of optimism from Drew and I, but I'm not ruling out that K-State can't win this game. This team is still good enough. The talent is there. It's just you don't know if you're going to get it on a consistent basis or really ever. So it's worth showing up for and seeing what happens on Saturday. And certainly a K-State win moves things in the right direction. And then you get a winnable road game on Monday at Texas because Texas doesn't like to beat anybody at home. So this is going to be a big next what? Uh, I'm not going to do the math hours, but this is a big next three days for K-State. Saturday, who cares about Sunday, and then a big <laughs> Monday for them. So two of the next three days, K-State could uh, define their season there, and if they lose both, uh, start making plans to go watch the Batcats of Toynton in March because that's the only K-State <laughs> athletics you're going to be seeing then. So for Drew Galloway, I am Mason Both. Thanks for watching K-State Online.